chapter 5, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and chapter 5. I want to read from verse 16 of chapter 4 to pick up the reading. Paul has been speaking to the believers at Corinth not to be cast down. Although they're cast down, they're, they've not been conquered, as he, as he says. So he says in chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, that's where we begin our reading. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, where we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore we, make, sorry, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to glory on our behalf, that you may have something to answer those who glory in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Then to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to speak to you about the greatest change ever. The greatest change ever. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 If anyone is in Christ he is a new creation all things have passed away behold all things have become new How would you describe a Christian? 
I shared with some friends some in another church some months back, and I may have mentioned this to you some time ago, uh, older men tend to reminisce quite a lot and forget what they've said in other places. But I remember when I was first converted um, and I, I lived in a road called Cambridge Road in Greenock in Scotland and uh, my the lady who became my wife lived across the road. And um, I wanted to tell people about the gospel because I'd been saved on the 1st of July 1966, a Friday evening, through the preaching of Dr. Billy Graham. And I wanted to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. So I managed, I found a little Christian bookshop in our hometown in Greenock and I got, went there and bought some little tracts. I didn't know much about the Christian faith. I'd only been saved maybe six or eight weeks, maybe something like that. I'd been converted and I wanted to tell people about the gospel. But as you can imagine, I was nervous and so I didn't go on the road I lived on. I went to two or three roads just down from there. Uh, from where we lived, from where I lived at the time with my parents, maybe just a couple of hundred yards away. And I went with these tracks and started knocking the doors of the neighbours down there, just started at number one and carried on through two or three roads. And I, all I had was uh, uh, three or four tracks, and I only knew two or three verses of the Bible, but I would go to the door and say to the person as they opened the door, I'd give them a tract and say, I wanted to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I didn't know what I'd say beyond that. Uh, but if they ask, I, I only knew scriptures like 1 Timothy 1.15, if anyone's, sorry, there's a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation of Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I knew, uh, I'd, I'd only just learned John 3.16 through my conversion experience. Um, and I, I knew Acts 4 verse 12. Uh, the salvation no one else no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved there were three or four verses absolute maxima I knew I didn't know anything else really uh, in any depth about the Christian faith as I say I never came from a Christian background my parents were not believers uh, not even church scores so I knew nothing about the Christian faith apart from what I had discovered through my conversion a few a couple of months before through Billy Graham's preaching. So I'd go to the door and I'd have these tracks in my hand. I'd give a track to somebody uh, and say, I want to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd gone to a number of doors and I went to this one door and he gave us track to this man. And they said, I want to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, go on then. I didn't know what to say. Except I said, well, I, I quoted these scriptures, you know, salvation, no one else, no other name under heaven, given among men by which we must John, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. I, I recited off these verses, and I made an escape from the door, but left a track with the man. I have no idea what happened to that man. He might have been a Christian man testing me. I have no idea. Never saw him again. So how would you describe a Christian how would you, if somebody stopped you in the street and said, well, I understand you go to church, what is a Christian? How would you describe a Christian? How would you speak about what it means to be a Christian? And it's a very legitimate question. Now, I'm assuming we're all believers here tonight, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you have been believers for many years. And you know it's a very legitimate question to how to be, be sure you're a Christian, how to know what a Christian is. After all, if you can't go to heaven without being a Christian, you'd better know what a Christian is. If we can't have our sins forgiven without being a Christian, we better know what a Christian is and what the Bible says a Christian is. So it's a very legitimate question. How would we answer that question? Well, the Bible the New Testament I'm looking at, and particularly here tonight, the Christian is described in numerous ways from different angles. So, for example, you might say to your neighbour or your contact, a Christian is somebody that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may say, well, what do you mean by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? And you've got to try and explain. It's not just an intellectual thing. It's something of the heart. The will is involved. You're affected by who Jesus Christ really is, what he has come to do when he died on the cross. What was the intention of Jesus on the cross of Calvary? Why did he come? Or you might say a Christian is somebody who has been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you're going to have to explain that too. And you might say well, a Christian is somebody who is converted uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or a Christian is somebody that knows Christ. 
All of these are legitimate ways of describing what a Christian is or the way to become a Christian. Or in Colossians 2.13, where Paul says a Christian is someone who has passed from darkness to light and death to life. In Acts 20.16, the apostle says a Christian is someone who has turned from Satan to God, from uh, to death to life and so on. And what Paul is doing here in 2 Corinthians 5.17 is really giving us a description of a Christian or in actual fact what happens to a person that becomes a Christian. It's a kind of picture portrait. What actually happens to a man or a woman who becomes a Christian? And Paul says a person who becomes a Christian is a new creation. They've had a whole new beginning to their life and to their existence. See how Paul puts it. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now that's a very familiar text. Preachers use it all the time. You've probably heard it a thousand times. Maybe that's an exaggeration. You've certainly heard it hundreds of times, I would imagine, from various preachers who have come here. And that's good and proper because it's a very important biblical text. And this is what this is this momentous change of which Paul speaks is something that happened to him on the road to Damascus. You know, he was going to haul people off to prison and to death, and the Lord Jesus Christ met him. And the Lord said to him, Who are you? Why are you persecuting me, Paul? Who are you, Lord? He says, Well, he's in black, he's in darkness at the moment, of course. Then we know the story how uh, things like scales fell from his eyes. He was baptized later on, and so on. But here's Paul saying to us, If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. That happened to Paul. And that dynamic, momentous change happens to everybody that becomes a Christian. If you're a Christian tonight, that's what's happened to you. You might wish things were a bit more deep than that in your heart and life but that's what's happened to you if you're in Christ you're a new creation so let's look at this in a little bit of, of detail it will help us a Christian is somebody says Paul who is in Christ he is in Christ in other words he comes to where he was not before he was not always in Christ he was not born in Christ Many people in our society think that, don't they? You know, you try to witness to them. And they think automatically when they die, they're going to heaven. And they're not. They think when they're born into this world, if they're born into a, a so-called Christian family or a Christian country, or maybe their parents went to church, maybe their parents were married in a church, and they, they make people think because of that, that makes them a Christian. They'll say, well, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Buddhist, I'm not an atheist, that must mean I'm a Christian. Not necessarily so, because Paul says a Christian is somebody who comes to be where he was not before. A Christian is somebody who is in Christ. And that speaks of a spiritual union that exists between the Saviour and the person who is a Christian. It's a saving union. It's something that saves them in a most wonderful way, just as so it's a union with Jesus Christ that the believer comes to have. The person that wasn't a believer becomes a believer, and that instant he's joined savingly, spiritually, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's, he's in union with Christ, just as a branch on a tree is in union with the tree, just as the parts of your body, your hand is in union with your arm, your arm is in union with your body. So a Christian is somebody who is in union with Jesus Christ himself. And it's a union that saves the soul, that delivers from sin and death, that transforms a person's whole life and existence and sets him on a whole new course, a whole new direction. That's what Paul is saying. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become New. Is that not a momentous change? You've tasted that. You've come to know that as a Christian tonight. You know all about that. You might wish, as I say, you were better, made better progress. We all wish that. You might wish you were more spiritual. But if you're a Christian, this is what has happened to you. This dynamic change 
has taken place. So a Christian then is in union with Christ. A Christian is somebody who is saved. And furthermore, a Christian is somebody who is being transformed, not instantly transformed, but a new creation has begun in the heart. So that all things are passed away and all things have become new. It is something that is decisive. We'll come back to that in a moment. In a very real sense, a Christian summon a man or a woman who, at conversion, enters a whole new world. Now, I've told this story before. I don't think I've told it here, but Jodie Foster, the actress, who's not a Christian believer by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but she, in, in, in her life story, she speaks of uh, her view of life, her values of life, her, her view of, the, of life itself, and the future and destiny and all these things. And she does not believe there's a world beyond the material. She would say, as a man said to me once, I only believe what I can touch, what I can see. So I asked him to go and get a hammer and a nail from his cupboard and drive it through electric cable that was in the wall of his hallway. And of course, you know, his response was, of course, well, I'd get electrocuted. And I said, well, you've, only just, you've just said to me, you only believe what you can see. There's a power about Christianity that you don't see, except in the effect it produces in the lives of people. Well, Jodie Foster was a believer in material things. Nothing spiritual was of any interest to her. But in a film that she is the main actress in, wasn't a Christian film by any means. She comes to realise there is a spiritual dimension in this world, a spiritual world. There's a world beyond the material and the physical. And at that moment she sees somebody and she witnesses something that transforms her whole thinking. Now in a far more wonderful way, that's what happens when you become a Christian. You see the world in a different way. You see a world that you thought didn't exist. You come to realise things that you thought were impossibilities. There's a God in heaven. There's a Jesus Christ who came and died on the cross for your sins. All of these things. We'll come back to that in a moment. So when you become a Christian, you become somebody who is transformed. And you enter a whole new world where momentous, incredible things are brought before your gaze. And you realise, you think, why did I not believe this message before? That's what Paul is telling us about here in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let me spend a few moments and try and unpack this or unravel this wonderful text and try and get something helpful for us. Well, we come back to this phrase, in Christ. It's clearly a very important phrase. It's used 76 times in the letters of the Apostle Paul. So I reckon it must be pretty important. If Paul speaks, uses this phraseology 76 times in his letters, it must be profoundly important. So, for example, he says in Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He tells the Ephesians in chapter 1 and verse 4 that he, God chooses in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Let me read a few verses to you from Paul's letter to Ephesians in chapter 2. Listen to the words and notice how many times he used the, the phrase phraseology in Christ. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love towards us with which he loved us, even when we are dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You get the message? It's there. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not a works lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Then verse 13 he says, But now in Christ Jesus you who were once far off have been made near by the blood of Christ. The phraseology and the phrase in Christ is clearly of great importance. And as, as I say, uh, it speaks of an intimate spiritual union that exists between Christ and believers. And it speaks of the greatest change that could be imagined. A transformation has begun. Now theologians speak of sanctification as definitive and progressive. When they say definitive, they mean it's something God does in the heart at the moment of the new birth, at regeneration. When instantly the soul is changed, the mind, the heart is changed. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. It begins. Then there's progressive sanctification, which you and I know about. We're endeavouring to be more holy and more Christ-like as the days and the years pass by. So the definitive thing is a thing that's almost beyond imagination. God does this by the power of his spirit. It's a change brought about then, not by man's cleverness, by man's ingenuity, by man's willpower. It's a product of the creative power of God by his spirit. When he changed the whole direction of your thinking, he gives you a new mind, a new heart. That's what Paul is speaking about. And a number of commentators make this point that when Paul speaks in this way, he seems to have in mind the creation, the beginning of Genesis, in Genesis 1, 2 and 3, especially Genesis 1, when God said, let there be light, and God created all the sea creatures, and God created the plants and the animal life and, and the stars and the heaven, the sun and moon and so on. It seems to be that Paul is speaking of the same thing. In Colossians chapter 1, 13, Paul says, uh, God has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. It's interesting, isn't it? You would have noticed at the crown of, the crown of King Charles a few months ago, Rishi Sunak read that very passage. What a passage to read. May God send it to his heart and our king's heart. So nothing less than this creative power of God is what brings about this momentous change. So it's not a case of man turning his life around. We hear that in the telly a lot, don't we? Or in magazines, I've turned my life around. It's not that. It's not a case of some woman turning her life around. It's a case of God the creator. So working in the soul so as to bring that soul into the realm and blessing of salvation. Joined to Jesus Christ for time, yes, and for eternity. Changing the disposition of the soul. And it's also clear that this great salvation is not only for here and now. It's a salvation, as I've indicated, that takes believers into heaven's glory at the last day. For every true Christian, therefore, everything has changed and changed in ways that are utterly breathtaking. Now, maybe you think, has that happened to me? Well, if you're a Christian, it has. And maybe we don't think about these things as we should because we're so immersed in the troubles of this life, we're so sometimes overcome by fears and troubles and perplexities and heartaches and the state of our society. And there's nothing in this world to help us. And we forget the momentous change that God has made in us. But if you're a Christian, you're a child of God, you're a child of grace, your destiny is heaven's glory. It is. Believe it. It's yours. And this is why Paul speaks as he does in verse 17. But you notice what, further what Paul says. His new creation is further defined or explained. Paul puts it this way. He says, all things have passed away. That's what he says in verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. And the wording Paul uses here underlines for us the fact that the old things which have passed away have passed away and it's interesting how the Greek is here. The things that have passed away are passed away forever. And they can't return. You can't become a non-Christian. Now we know people that have professed faith in Christ. You have known them, I have known them. But a true Christian never becomes a non-Christian. He may at times act as a non-Christian. 
But once a person is born again, that does not change. And that's what Paul seems to be indicating here. There's no going back from this in terms of essential spiritual life and vitality. All things have passed away and they ain't coming back again. It's all changed for forever. So let's ask a question. What are these old things that have passed away? Well, this is what Paul speaks of here. And first of all, our old ways of viewing Christ in our unconverted state. Well, we never knew much about him. We never thought about him. This is what Paul is referring to in verse 16. You'll notice from verse 16. That's why Paul says in verse 16, From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. What is he talking about? He's saying, we once thought Christ was just an ordinary man. That's what Paul is saying. He was a man, maybe a great man, a godly man, a wonderful man, almost angelic, but just a man. We never revered him, we never loved him, we never adored him. The one before the angel whom the angels veiled their faces, we never gave him a second thought. That's what Paul's talking about in verse 16. And that's why when he comes to verse 7, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. And I don't think of Christ anymore, he says, the way I used to think of him. So the, our old way of viewing Christ in our unconverted state, how what we believed about him, what we thought about him, all that's changed. When you become a Christian, Christ is everything to you. If Christ is not everything to you, you're not a Christian. It's as plain as face as a face as, as your face as the nose of your face it's plain and clear Christ is everything to a Christian now we don't as I say always think of him as we should pray to him as we should trust him as we should but if Christ if you're a Christian Jesus Christ is everything to you he's the foundation of your life and he's the one that you love better than anything else but then something else has changed our old view of God has passed away we never saw him as the great creator, righteous in all his ways, pure and, and just in everything he says and does. We never thought of God in that way. If we thought of God at all, we thought, well, he's away up in the mist somewhere in the sky. What's he like? Some old grandfather with a long beard. That's the way people think of him. The people in our society speak of him. The man upstairs, this irreverent, blasphemous speech. Maybe we did that in our unconverted days. But when we become Christians, we realize God is majestic, glorious, and ineffable. We can't explain him. He's glorious in every possible way. When you become a Christian, you realize how wonderful he is. My God, how wonderful thou art. We sing of him, don't we? Another way, one of the things uh, that changes for us is, is sin. What sin is? We never thought of our sin as a repulsive thing in the sight of God. We thought we were okay. We thought, well, I'm not as bad as that person down the road, that child molester, that felon, that rapist, that murderer. I'm not like Putin, who's butchering people or people in other parts of the world. We never thought of ourselves as sinners. But when we come to know Christ and it's part of our conversion experience, we realise we are sinful and blind and foolish by nature and we are hateful in the sight of God until we come to know Christ. So all that's changed. So our view of Christ has changed. Our view of God has changed. Our view of our sin has changed. And then there's something else that changed. And what was it? What do you think it was? It's our view of salvation. How I get saved? How can I get saved? How can I come to know God? How can I have my sins forgiven? Surely, surely I just count up all my good deeds and I've got this board here and there's all my despicable things I've said. But here, you know, I've been okay. I've one, two, three, four, five, six. I've done 10, 12 lovely things the last few weeks. And that surely outweighs my sinful behavior. And we thought we could save ourselves. We thought that uh, our righteous deeds, our prayers, our gifts to charity, even our church attendance could earn us 
favour with God. We thought, well, this is the way to find, get points with God. And if ever we had any serious hopes of a safe journey to heaven when we died, we felt sure God can overcome all my filthy lusts and my sins, the things I've said, thought and done over the weeks and the years. I'm not like these people that do these despicable things. And we never gave any serious thought to the rank and belief that shaped and controlled our lives day by day, year by year. My dear friends, if you're a Christian tonight, you realise all of that was a fallacy, false religion. And your heart was changed and you realised, I can't save myself. And that's why you came to Christ. You realised you couldn't save yourself. You can't wash away the past. You can't undo the things you've done wrong against God. You can't give yourself a new heart. Only Christ can give you that. And that's why Paul speaks as he does here. And I'm reminded of the great statement of Thomas Chalmers, the Scottish theologian, when he speaks of the expulsive power of a new affection. He's talking about the new birth, regeneration, this text. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Hold all things are become new. And so Paul then in 2 Corinthians 5.17 is saying that this instantaneous change, this regeneration, this renewal of the heart is like a spiritual explosion in the soul that gets rid of the chaos of the past. Not perfectly but instantly a new beginning begins, if that's not bad grammar. In every believer then, God gets rid of the chaos. He gets rid of the filth of the past. Our lives prior to conversion and begins to build in our hearts a whole new set of values and desires. We love him because he first loved us. We never loved Christ before. We couldn't be bothered with him. Because he interfered with our lives. God wants it to be holy. No, I want my sin. I want my lusts. I want to do what I want. But when you become a Christian, you want to do what God wants. You know that in your heart. What a wonderful change God has made in your heart as a Christian. And so a Christian is a person who has entered a whole new world of spiritual thinking. I refer to Jodie Foster. Well, that's what she found, not in this sense, but in a, in, a legit, in, a, in a limited sense in her film. She discovered something that was quite momentous. And the Christian, when you become a Christian, you discover something quite momentous. Wonderful to think of it. You've got new views of God, of yourself, of your sin, of salvation. All of your own thoughts about these things are gone forever. This wonderful change has taken place. Listen to the words of one of the hymns uh, I thought earlier might be appropriate. You know these hymns. Listen to the words of this glorious George Wade Robinson hymn. You know it. As soon as I utter the first line, you'll know it. Loved with everlasting love. Led by grace that love to know. Spirit breathing from above, you have taught me it is so. Oh, this full and perfect peace. Oh, this rapture all divine, in a love which cannot cease, I am his and he is mine. Heaven above is softer blue, earth around is sweeter green, something lives in every hue, Christless eyes have never seen. Birds with gladder songs or flow, flowers with deeper beauty shine, since I know as now I know, I am his and he is mine. His forever, only his, who the Lord and me shall part. Ah, with what a rest of bliss Christ can fill the loving heart. Heaven and earth may fade and flee, firstborn light and gloom decline, but while God and I shall be, I am his and he is mine. That's your testimony, isn't it? Is it? Of course it is. If you're a Christian, that's your testimony. So Christian, believer, brother, sister, have you grasped how momentous this change has been and is. Yes, you say, well, I struggle with sin. Yes, of course you do. So did Paul who wrote this great text. So did every Christian down the ages. The only person that never struggled with indwelling sin was the Lord Jesus because he had, he had none. 
Although he resisted sin from Satan and sin outside of himself. And sometimes you wrestle with sin and you wonder how far, how am I getting on the Christian life? Well, that's good for us to assess ourselves and come back to God and renewed repentance and faith and deepening of our spiritual lives. Because sometimes you find you struggle with sin. Sometimes sin gets the upper hand, doesn't it? Sometimes it prevails over you. You know it. But you're in Christ and you're a new creation. That's why you hate sin so much. That's why you sorrow over your sins. And that's why it brings you more and more to the Lord Jesus. What a transformation. One should tra- face a dreadful future. You had no hope beyond the grave, but all that has changed. Do you think about this? When you go to tell your neighbours about the Lord Jesus, do you have this in your heart? Think of it, what Christ can do for that stubborn, filthy mouthed neighbour of yours. What Christ can do to change him or her. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's a time when you were about to fall into hell. And if Christ had not reconciled you to God, you would have gone there. But you now have a new nature. You have a relationship with God. The one who set the stars in place is your heavenly father. The one who sent his son to die for your sins. You have a relationship with him. That's why you can pray. That's how we can pray to, to God, our father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. That's why his name is sacred to you. Oh, how I love the Saviour's name. This is number 20 in our Christian hymns. How wonderful thou art. And can you not sing? Well, we're going to sing it in a few minutes. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine, for thee all the pleasures of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Saviour, art thou, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. How can we sing such amazing things? We can do so because we are in Christ Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Well, if anyone is in Christ, anyone, whoever it may be you're speaking to, they can be saved by the Lord Jesus. Anyone means they're not too old, not too sinful, not too degraded to be united to Christ. I'm reminded of that story which I've told before in other places of that lady of the streets, the prostitute going her way to throw herself off London Bridge. And she heard the singing at the Metropolitan Tabernacle of Charles Spurgeon was just starting to preach as she walked in the door. And he was preaching on the woman uh, who was a harlot. And as he was preaching, he said, see that woman? Just this woman who entered the door, 6,000 members of the congregation. Now, he didn't know this woman. He just says, seest thou that woman? And she was arrested spiritually on the spot and transformed and became a lovely Christian member of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. God knows the hearts of your hearers. My brothers and sisters, we are few tonight. Take courage. Remember, God can transform. He's changed you. He can change your neighbours. Tell them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen.